So welcome again to the last session <laughs> this is about learning and planning. So we have uh, two papers, not just one speaker, Fernando Fernandez. So it's your turn. So thank you very much. Well, the good thing about being the last one is that all of people here is at least or they are or you are or, or, or friends of mine <laughs> or you are really very interested <laughs> so that's a good point so the talk uh, my talk is about creating planning portfolios with predictive models so in fact I'm, as I as said I'm going to present to 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 different uh, works the IBACO planning system instance based configured portfolios which is uh, a work uh, published in the journal of artificial intelligence research and then, uh, and, and that work is kind of the motivation of the following work, which is performance modeling of planners from homogeneous problem sets, uh, which is published here in ICAPS in the planning and learning track. So uh, I will make a brief introduction and will show the objectives, and then I will go in depth in both parts of, of this uh, uh, complete research. First, the IVA COP, and then planning performance in homogeneous uh, problem sets. So the idea is that some, uh, the original idea is that there is no single planner, which is always the best planner for all planning tasks. So as we all, all know, uh, so it seems to, to be interesting idea to create portfolios as a set of planners that could be ag uh, aggregated and that can be used uh, to to solve uh, a, a, a planning task. But what is a, a portfolio? So we understand a portfolio as a uh, as a as a set of uh, planners that we can uh, take. We assume that we have an, a maximum execution time. So the portfolio is considered as the sequence of of, of n pairs, the planner and time, uh, that shows and the sequence on, on which the planners will be executed, and with the constraints that the uh, summarization of all the running times for all the planners is less than a, a, a maximum time uh, t. So when we are creating uh, planning portfolios, uh, we have different elements to take into account. The first thing that we have to, to think is uh, the set of base planners that we want to, to use to, to, to build uh, the planner portfolio. So we can combine uh, heuristics and, and search and uh, uh, algorithms. We can make domain optimized portfolio planners. We can take completely independent planners, so there are many approaches in the literature. The second thing that we need to take into account is how we configure the portfolio. Uh, basically, there are two main approaches to configure a static or dynamic uh, portfolios. In a static portfolios, we uh, define the same uh, configuration, portfolio configuration for all domains and for all the, every problem in, in, in the domain. Sometimes we make domain-specific configurations, so maybe we define uh, a set of uh, the, the, planning, the planning configuration just for the, uh, all the, the problems in the same domain. In a uh, completely dynamic uh, configuration for every uh, problem in, a, in any domain, we define a specific portfolio configuration that we can uh, set up. <coughs> Um, there are also different criteria for planner selection and execution orders. So we can could make maximum the coverage, uh, play the planners in our own robin uh, way with predictive models, or in function of the contribution to the wall, uh, to the to the to the performance in in a world training set. So our our, our approach uh, then is our, our goal is to uh, def, uh, is based on the idea that. Uh, static portfolio configuration are suboptimal because there is always uh, different planners which are which solve better problems in, in, in the same domain. So we want to focus in instance-specific uh, configurations. But to make an instance-specific configuration, we need kind of an oracle uh, that tells us which is the best planner for that specific problem in the specific domain. So the most similar thing that we have to an oracle is empirical performance models, which is the idea of the bus planner uh, some time ago, in which we define predictive models that uh, tell us what are the, the, the planners that, we co that are considered the best for, that, for such a problem. Um, the problem is that predictive models are not perfect, and we, sometimes we uh, there are uncorrelated uh, shallow features. So, um, and, and somehow we should ensure that the plan that the portfolio has a base a, a set of diverse uh, planners uh, to perform correctly. So we propose uh, the IBACOP uh, structure that we have in the in the slides. 
uh, which is based in three main steps. So at the beginning, we assume that we have the planners so and we have a lot of several benchmark domains. So for instance, we have uh, uh, 27 planners. And the first step is just to uh, execute all the planners in the benchmark domains to obtain uh, the, in the, planning, the, the planning performance. So with this uh, information, we can start to make a, a, a first filtering uh, of the planners that we want to include uh, in, our, in, our, in our system. And then uh, we go to the following steps in which we are able to create uh, predictive models that will uh, try to predict uh, the behavior of, of, of the planners. Maybe we want to predict if, if, to, if the planner will be able to solve a specific task or even how long it will take to, to get the best, qual the best uh, solution. So then from this phase we can create uh, models and then we go to the strategy selection in which we use the knowledge learned in these models to configure portfolios in different ways. So the first step is planner filtering and what we propose in IVACOP is, to, uh, the, uh, is the QT Pareto score filtering. So the idea here is that we have, a, a, if we have a two, a two planners and in a specific uh, problem, a specific planning task, uh, we say that uh, one planner, dom uh, QT Pareto dominates the other one if it obtains uh, a solution with equal or lar better uh, quality, uh, and but in uh, a reduced, uh, but with less time. Okay. <coughs> Uh, with this uh, dominance, we can make like a ranking uh, of, of, of planners. So the idea here of the QT Pareto score for a domain is to execute all the, all the planners in all the problems of such a domain and uh, make a ranking of the, of, the, of the planners, taking into account how much uh, or how, uh, how, how many times the planner QT dominates to other planners. So the, the, the planner that in average takes uh, um, uh, um, QT that in average QT dominates more to other planners will be the first of the ranking, and the uh, planners that are not able to QT dominate uh, other planners in uh, in that problem will be in the lower side. So that is the idea of this of this ranking. So then, uh, given that we have a ranking of planners in, in a domain, we can select planners taking into account which of them uh, are in the top of the, of the domain. So a, a simple way to select planners uh, is, to, is to get the planner that obtains the highest score in every domain. Uh, to evaluate this approach, we made the following experiment. We took uh, a lot of uh, base planners from the IPC, all the planners from the IPC competition plus LPG. We used all the benchmark domain in that competition for learning. We used the typical uh, com um, evaluation mechanisms of, of the competition, and we evaluated different configuration. So th the QT is the, is the portfolio, is a portfolio uh, created with the QT Pareto uh, dominance. Q will be a portfolio using uh, only quality to, to select the planners. T for time, uh, confidence, and the OET is a portfolio using the 28 planners of the competition. So, um, and so we uh, create the portfolio and we assign time uh, to every planner in the portfolio which is un uh, uniformly distributed. So here we see the results, and the idea here we can see clearly is that all the strategies that uh, select the planner just uh, only with quality, time, or coverage, they are uh, of, they can obtain uh, only uh, slightly better results than the configuration that uses all the planners. So somehow they are, they are telling that they are not uh, getting a, a, an interesting. Uh, set of set of planners, and we, as we see, the QT Pareto uh, dominance uh, gets the better results, uh, and uh, so yeah, and, and the results has much higher than the results than the other ones. Uh, taking into account that these results are uh, uh, in the the quality score of the, of the competition. So why do we obtain better results than, than other approach, uh, uh, selection approaches? Well, here we want, we will give a kind of an explanation. Here we order the, the planners taking into account the, the ranking uh, in the IPC uh, competition for all the planners. 
And then we have market here, which planners are selected but e by each configuration. Uh, and the last column is just the planners which are based in fast downward. Okay, so as we can see here, uh, well, if we use coverage, we uh, we select too many planners, so we are not almost uh, filtering the, the problems. If we uh, use time, we um, select planners uh, in a diverse way, but the solutions are not good because in somehow we are selecting by time, but not for quality and for the competition quality is, is much more important. Um, if we focus in quality, we, we see that uh, we, we make a strong filtering, but most of the planners selected are based on fast downward. So it, that reduces the diversity of the, of, the, of the portfolio. However, we can see that the QG Parito dominance selects planners that are even in the worst uh, part of the, of the results of the competition, but uh, in fact they, the, those planners are good in some domains. So to, to achieve a, 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 an average good solution, we need also those planners in the portfolio. Once we have, the, once we have the, this first filtering, we can go um, and try to build predictive models that are able to, 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 make, to get more information and to uh, make an additional uh, filtering. So to, to create predictive models, the first thing that we need to do is to create a set of, of features that characterize uh, the, the planning tasks. So we have de uh, we developed it in, uh, for, for IBACOP up to 114 features. Those are features which are extracted from the PDDL and uh, domain description, from fast down one instantiations, from uh, uh, heuristic values in the initial states. We can compute the landmark graph in the initial state, so we can also get information from that, from the SAS plus representations, and, uh, what we call, uh, and the fat balance uh, features. I will not go in details, but you have all the information of, uh, of the f specific features in the papers, and if you have any, any doubt, you can contact us. So then, so then we have the features. We, we, I will say how we create the, the data sets. So uh, we uh, use uh, 45 different domain descriptions from IPCs. And we input to the, to the models the features, the problems and domain features, but also the, the performance data, the planner, the, if it solved the task or not, and the time that it took to, to, solve, uh, to get the, the best uh, solution if, in case they, they, you solved the task. So we uh, learned two different types of models. We learned classification models and regression models. Classification models will predict if the planner is able to solve the specific uh, planning tasks that we are providing. The regression models are able to, pre uh, are able to, pre uh, to predict the <coughs> time needed to get the best solution in that specific problem. So we create uh, both uh, tasks. Uh, what are the results from when we create the empirical performance models in following these uh, ideas? Well, uh, take, uh, for the classification, uh, we made a lot of experiments with different learning mo uh, algorithms, and we obtained the best solution with rotation forest and an accuracy of 90% of time, that which means that the 90% of times we are able to predict if the planner will solve the, the problem or not. And we also have, um, and for the regression, uh, we uh, learned the best solution with decision tables, obtaining a relative absolute uh, error of 64%. So then, once we have these predictive models, then we, what we need to do is to deploy the solution to create the portfolios with those predictive models. And here there are uh, many uh, uh, approaches. So Given that we have models, we can just not discard them, so that is a first approach. The other one is use the classification model only, and the other one is use both classification and regression models. So depending on how much knowledge we use, uh, we, can, uh, we can create different uh, configurations. Uh, if there are two problems, maybe the, the models predict that no planner will solve the problem task, the problem, uh, or, or, that, or the opposite and that uh, all the uh, planners will solve. So in, in that case, in one case we filter too much and in the other one we uh, don't filter at all. So we focus, instead of on, on the class, we just use the confidence to predict the positive class. The class. So if we just use the confidence, instead of having yes or not, we have a ranking of, of how the, the prediction is for every, uh, for every planner. 
So the other thing that we need to know is how many planners to use because now we have a ranking. So the, the experiments that we did is just to create uh, portfolios uh, with different number of, uh, of planners. So here uh, in, in green, in the green is the, the behavior of the, of, the, of the planning portfolio with all the uh, planners selected in previous phase with the QT Pareto dominance. And, um, and then we, we show the results only using one planner a portfolio with two planners, with three planners, etc. So we can see here that mainly with five, six planners, we are reading the top of the of the results. So that tells us that we don't need much more planners in the portfolio. So we can eliminate more. So that these are the different configurations. So the idea is that uh, we have at the beginning 28 planners from the competitions. The IVA COP just used the QT Pareto score filtering, so reduces from 28 to only 12 uh, planners. If we use the classification models to get only five planners, we are in the IVA COP2 uh, configuration in the, uh, in the IPC competitions. And in, then we also use the regression model to decide how much time we provide to, the, to each planner, we are in the IVA COP2 best first estimated uh, configuration. We follow with the classical experimentation setting of the, of the IPC competition. We compare it with two uh, planners and also with two baseline portfolios. In one, we selected the planners randomly. In the other one, we selected the best planners known. And here, we have uh, the results. They are not, the, these results are not exactly the same that, that we obtained in the, in the paper because uh, these this, this have uh, some uh, new elements. But we can see IVACOP obtains a very accurate uh, results just with the QT Pareto dominance. The results can be improved a little bit with, uh, when we add the classification models by reducing also the number of classes. And no uh, improvement seems to be achieved with the uh, regression models. So I think I have to stop. <laughs> <laughs> so I have two more slides to explain some more uh, things, but given that I'm uh, running out of time, uh, I think the conclusions from the system is that uh, we could create a uh, planning portfolios that the proposed features provide a good uh, idea of the behavior of the planners, the, pro the performance, uh, the configuration strategies are accurate, and the results uh, were well known, and we did a, a good job in the past planning competition. Um, I wonder um, if you would be able to extract reasons why planners are good. So assume we have two planners um, and then two domains and one planner works well on one domain and the other works well on the other. Um, could, you, could you extract um, the features um, of your model that tell you that one planner is good in one domain and the other is in the other? I mean, I, you have lots of features, right? Mm -hmm. I guess. Um, for, for such a particular question, um, not all teachers are relevant. And could you could you um, like I don't know give provide a reason like like a couple of features um, that tell you why one planner is better than the other? What are the policies and the predictive models really learning? So you have to wait to the following talk. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> One more question. So I was wondering also if uh, for the for the predictive model that you are using the, like a uh, set of planners to to get these outputs, but it's exactly the input to this regression model from your planners. Maybe I missed something, but well, what we may input to the predictive models is is all the information that we can get from the from the from the planning tasks. Okay, so that's why I I, I uh, define it here the the set of features that we use. So we extract, for instance, from PDDL feature, uh, the, uh, plan for PDDL uh, files, the number of objects in the problem, from the fast than one instance sheeted, the number of generated rules in the translation process to SAS plus task. So we are able to obtain um, up to um, more than 100 features, and those features are the ones that we uh, provide to the predictive models to perform uh, the predictions. <coughs> yeah. 
uh, thank you for this. Is I, I love this work, by the way. Uh, I think it's a natural fit, right? So that I would like it. But I'm I'm really curious at what this says about the problems uh, the, the the competition uses. Um, I've long for a long time. I think you can a lot of people use portfolios in one direction to get better performance, and, and this is a well-known result. Not so many people turn it around. Your next talk is about using it to examine the features, right? So if you invert that view, you can use it like a telescope or a microscope to examine it. So I think one, one thing, one direction I would like to see is examining the problems. What can you say about the problems at this point? Have you looked at this yeah. question? Yeah, I think I will answer that question also in the, in, in the following talk. Thank That's you. why I tell that I, that I talk here. I have to do the whole talk just uh, sequentially. <laughs> <laughs> because <laughs> you are completely right. You are completely yeah. right. <laughs> so, and the next talk, Fernando, <laughs> will be talking about performance modeling of planet from homogeneous problem set. So, you will answer some of your questions. So, thank you very much. Thanks for coming to my talk. <laughs> So uh, the motivation of, of this talk is what I have uh, done before, okay? And the idea is that, okay, we, we have demonstrated that we can uh, uh, learn predictive models that permit to build a good uh, portfolios, okay? But uh, the, the idea is, what are we really uh, learning? So what are the predictive models really learning from, the, from all the features that, that we provide them? So uh, the, the good thing about machine learning is that we can use uh, uh, predict, uh, uh, readable models like decision trees that, that we can read and understand. So this is, uh, for instance, one of the, plan of the, of the first uh, trees that we uh, generated in the, in the, in the, in the beginning of the research. So here you can say that uh, a decision tree starts to ask for the values of the feature. So it starts to count how uh, if the total number of edges in the causal graph is uh, minor than whatever, if one ratio is minor or whatever, and if the output weight is minor or equal than whatever, and if the fat balance average is whatever. If the planner is urban, then it, will, it won't be able to solve the task. Okay, and if the planner is uh, 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 fast down one to two one, it won't be able to solve the task. But then, if, if the planner is another one, then it checks the requirements. So the requirements in a in the in a domain are if the if the planner is a strip or or, or if it has conditional effects. So it look for us like it's it's learning strange things somehow. Okay, so the idea is that some features that we use can show correlations with the predicted variables, but without a clear causality. So for instance, it seems that the number of SAS plus variables affect the runtime for solving a problem. It could be nice, but how many, how, what is the influence of the number of PDDL fats in the initial state? Because you can even take one domain uh, add more, more, much more fats in the, initial, in the initial state without co changing anything in the problem, and then the features will change. So how is that could how could that influence in, in in the domain? So the idea is that the hardness of problems should not be related to these shallow features that could even be tricked with changes in, in the in the PDDL uh, level. So that is what what idea. So 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 our, our motivation was just what would you have asked? So what are learning are really learning pretty models that take into account the important things or what we understand like important things. So to clarify, we can say that the empirical performance model may encode knowledge as a combination of different uh, capabilities. We can learn domain, uh, we can make a domain discrimination. So maybe the, the, perform the empirical performance model are able to discriminate between different types of domains. We can also discriminate between problems of different types or, or different size. And we can, and what we, it seems to for us more interesting if we can discriminate depending on the predictive uh, 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 search space, which is what maybe is more interesting from, from the point of view of planning. So the idea is that, uh, so wha what's happening? That planning uh, empirical performance models have been usually trained using the set of available benchmarks. And available benchmarks are IPC benchmark. And IPC problems are created in a specific way for the competition. We, we make some easy problems, a little bit, uh, some more which are harder, 
and the hardest one, so we make them in progression. So at, at the end, we have an heterogeneous problem uh, set. We have uh, for each domain problems which are very different among themselves. So the, the, under these circumstances, it is very hard to isolate the effect of the different types of discrimination. So our goal here is to check whether EPMs are just learning the domain uh, structure or the problem side. And what we want to check is if we really are learning something about the, the search space. Okay? So the objective of this work is to identify domain and problem sets where the search space discrimination is necessary, so we will create homogeneous problem sets. We want to validate the learning capabilities of planning empirical performance models in these problem sets, and then we want to analyze what features are relevant to predict uh, the, or, or to make this space uh, search space discrimination. So the first step is to create homogeneous problem sets. But what is an homogeneous problem set? So we define an homogeneous problem set as a set, as a set of problems which are uh, uh, of the same domain. They, they have the same number of objects, and which initial states and, and goals have exactly the same configuration. So from a practical point of view, to create, for, to create an homogeneous problem set, we just go, need to go to the IPC random problem generators. We provide exactly the same input parameters, and then we create a lot of problems, okay, for each in domain. And that is what, what we did. And uh, here is uh, uh, an example of how the, the uh, specific planner solves one homogeneous problem set, which is created for the Barman domain with these characteristics. And, and, and as we can see, uh, even give, providing the, the random generator and the same uh, the set of parameters, we create problems which are of different difficulty. Because most of the problems are solved between 5 and 14 seconds, but there are problems that even need 1,000 seconds. So why are so difficult if a priori they uh, seem to be uh, so, uh, so, so similar? So to, t uh, uh, to obtain also interesting problem sets, because that no doesn't happen in everywhere, in the, for every uh, planner and every domain, we need to define uh, the coefficient of variator of planner room time. So what we need to check is the dispersion of the level of running. So do we need to evaluate if in, in the given a planner and a domain and an homogeneous problem set, there are really differences in the planning in the in, in the planning run time. So we define the coefficient of variation like as the this, the standard deviation divided by the by the mean. So large values of this coefficient means that Run, running times are, uh, are diverse, and if the value is close to zero, means that most problems in that domain are solved in almost the same time. Okay. So here is the results of, of the, uh, the computation of, the, of this coefficient of variation for three different planners, which are the ones that we have evaluated in all the different domains. So as we can see, for instance, PRO in the transport uh, solves most problems in almost the same time. So that's why it, it gets a coefficient almost uh, zero. But there are many pro, many many uh, planner domain uh, pairs in which the coefficient of variation uh, is is high, and those are for us the interesting uh, 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 data sets to evaluate because are data sets in which uh, uh, homogeneous uh, problem sets in which we obtain different results with the same planner. So then we, what we do want to do is, is to, to label the, the, the input data for the empirical performance model. So what we want to do is to differentiate between two classes, the hard problems and the easy problems. So uh, a first way to differentiate uh, the easy of hard problems is to take into account the real data from the, from the real data. So we assume that we have 1800 seconds. So this, the, the problems that are solved in 1800 seconds are the easy, and, the other, and, and if we don't solve, are the hard problems. But we, may, we can also take uh, uh, good, good points. So maybe we can say that, uh, for instance, in the next slide, we can select the 95% of problems solved. So we have these easy problems, but the DQ or the distribution are defined as the uh, hard problems. But if we select a 66% of, 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 of easy problems, then this, the distribution changes. So what we want to check is if we are able to differentiate easy and hard problems even when the cutoff is, is set in different places. Okay. So here is the, the experimental uh, evaluation and, and the, the first uh, 
evaluation that we, that, that we did. And in this case, uh, we used two different feature sets. The, the set of features that we use um, in the IPC and that are shown in J. And uh, uh, a new set of, um, but, but for this new work, we also developed uh, uh, some more features. Okay, as before, I will not enter in details. Okay, but think that we had we had the previous feature sets and and, and and also some new ones that we have created. Um, we use the, the different training algorithms. Um, we use as a metric not the accuracy of the of the of the um, of the classifiers, but the uh, curve and uh, the area under the rock curve which uh, is independent of the class balance. Class balance is a typical problem in machine learning. So for instance, here you think in this data set, 95% of, of, the, of the problems of the instances of the learning data set belongs to the same class. So a, a, a classifier that returns that uh, easy for all the, all the, the, the tasks are really uh, has an accuracy of 95%, okay? So that's why we uh, use a, a different metric which kind of, which more or less tell us the probability of ranking a random positive example higher than a random negative example. But if you don't want to think much about that, is you just think that a random classifier will provide a value, uh, an, uh, an, uh, an error rock of 0 0.5. So a higher value means that we are really learning something about the domain, okay? And that is what we show in the, in the following slide, in which we saw the results for the different planners. We use uh, the two different feature sets. So here we, all, we use only the, uh, IV2 is only the features of IVACOP, all is all the new feature sets. We uh, show here the, the percentage of, of problems solved in, in 1800 seconds. Okay, so uh, and here is the, uh, uh, the, the outlook value for each uh, uh, data set. So here, for instance, we saw that uh, for all the uh, data sets, we obtain values which are uh, higher than the 0 0.5. So we can see that uh, for all the domain, the empirical performance models are able to extract knowledge and to make accurate predictions about the uh, classification performance uh, about the performance of, of the planners. So, uh, so for instance, uh, in, uh, also we can see that for uh, that typically when we use uh, the new feature sets, values are a little bit larger than with the IVACOP uh, planning set. So, with uh, with that we understand that the new features that we introduce in in this work are providing additional information to the features that we had uh, in the past. And in the worst results, if you see, you are thinking, for instance, in this 0 0.51, uh, in fact, are, is, is, is due to, to also to the unbalance of the, of the problem, because here we, are, we have a cutoff of 75%, but in fact, uh, in fact only 86% uh, of the problems were solved. So in this data set, there are only a few examples of the uh, of hard problems. Okay. So then, uh, so with this uh, results, we really can tell that we are able to predict the behavior of the planners over homogeneous problem sets. And what we want to do then is to see how are the features, uh, um, or, or, or just to rank the features and how to to try to understand what features are providing more knowledge uh, when we are trying to differentiate hard or easy problems. So uh, in this case, we perform the analysis, uh, uh, the performance analysis for a data, for data set uh, with uh, the 75 cutoff. And we use a typical uh, uh, mechanism in machine learning, which is a ranker of features uh, that uh, that uh, is the gain ratio, which basically uh, uh, makes a rankings of the features, taking into account how correlates the feature, the, the, the features, with the uh, output class. Uh, we make a, a, a the visual results of an average rank of tenfold uh, partitions. And, and we uh, evaluate an important thing. Uh, so we uh, only, uh, I only will only show the features that in, uh, has an average rank lower than, uh, or equal than five. 
So if, uh, if, uh, in at least one planner or domain set. So all the features which are uh, in the ranks uh, uh, below, uh, with values higher than five, we don't, uh, we don't, we don't take them into account if it, they don't appear some, in some problem. So we also show the best average, which is the maximum average rank obtained over all the domains. And we also uh, show the time relevance, which is the number of data sets where the feature was relevant, so the gain ratio was higher than zero. So here is the summary of, of, the, of the features. So uh, obviously there is no features here for, for PDDNA domain and all these things, because all those features has exactly the same value for all the problems in, the, uh, in an homogeneous problem set. So this, year, this, uh, is, this is the summary. We can see uh, also that almost half of the relevant features are features that we developed for this new, in this, for this new work. So, so, so these feature sets are, are interesting, and, and well, this, the, the, the features that I introduced here are, are very relevant for, for, any, for, for, for many of the data sets uh, applied. So a conclusion, we can say that uh, the, the, that the so general conclusion of, of, of this work we can say that APM support the construction of very accurate planning portfolios. We can say that really f and that the empirical performance models really help to differentiate between the easy and hard problems. Um, we have defined this new set of features, and, but the, we really think that there is a still a, a space for improvement. So, uh, for instance, when, when we created the planning portfolios, we didn't get good results with the regression models. So when we uh, tried to, pre to use the predicting running time to create the portfolios, we didn't get advantage, probably because we didn't uh, try or we, didn't ha we don't have yet the accurate set of features that, uh, are, uh, that support this, this prediction. So we think that we new features must be developed to make better predictions. And obviously, uh, we think that interpreting the empirical performance models and analyzing, analyzing in depth why these features tell us and uh, helps us to differentiate between easy and hard problems could support the planning community to, to improve the, their own planners. Um, Thank you very much. For more information, you can read uh, Isabel's Tenamore PhD thesis, which has all of these ideas and also the portfolios in temporal planning. So thank you. So, it's time for a new round of questions. <laughs> Well, I hope, I hope that at least partially I answer the, the previous I, I, I'm ones. I'm curious though, well, I, I, I'll, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm curious, uh, you know, you mentioned the search space features and you sort of talked about some of those things that you might be able to tell now. So if you tied it back to say Hoffman's taxonomy or other, other situations that, other um, analyses that have provided some insight into when planners do well, what, or do you have any insights on where you might go with this? Toward that direction. Yeah, I, well, I think that uh, one, one interesting idea that we have here is, um, uh, is just to go in depth in, in, in that feeling. So the idea is that if we check why, for instance, these landmark features uh, are, are helping us to differentiate, it's because uh, somehow those features are telling us, th are telling things about the complexity of the problems. But, th but there is an interesting result. Uh, I didn't put it here because the table was very large, that the features that are important depends, uh, may depend on the domain, but may depend also the planner. So features that are very good for one planner are completely useless, useless for another planner. And that happens. So I think... There's so much work on H, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, sorry, HFF, sort of an H plus heuristic, that uh -huh. that might be the, a natural place to start. Because so many planners rely on that. Yeah. In the past, have relied on it, right? So. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So uh, there are things that once we evaluated, yeah. Uh, yeah, you touched on it a little bit there, but I was wondering um, to what degree the most important um, features are consistent from one domain to another. Is there any, you know, any way to come up with a relatively small set? So if you're given a brand new domain and you're trying to, to 
um, use those same features for a brand new domain? What would you do? Well, typically in machine learning, we say that once you change the data set, uh, you don't you know nothing. <laughs> So, uh, if you generalize what you've learned, so that's what I'm getting at, you know, can we, or would there be a way to extend the work to generalize across domains rather than just focusing on domains? I mean, maybe could, you could find some insights or so some characteristics of the domain that, that may support that. I think that most of the time you need to, uh, to evaluate. So well, the, the good thing about this is that f maybe you can think it in, in, the, in an opposite way. So maybe uh, when you uh, have different domains, maybe you can even use those features just to, clear, to, to create clusters of domains. Mm -hmm. Because uh, you can imagine that uh, you can use uh, features not to predict the behavior of the planners, but how kind of to cluster the, the type of problems. So maybe you know that one planner is good in, in one cluster when you receive a new domain. Uh, if the domain belongs to the same cluster, maybe uh, and the, the solvers that were good also there are also good for, for that. So maybe that's uh, also a good, uh, a good idea. But in any case, I think it was also important, as I didn't say, that um, uh, that uh, when we create the empirical performance models, the models are also good for uh, predicting things in domains which are completely new. So for instance, in the last IPC, I, I don't remember exactly how many domains were new, but I think it was like eight or five domains. Okay, and, and, and IVACO behave well also in those domains. So it is not that it is very adapted to the domain. And <coughs> Uh, you were talking about that, uh, that you have uh, recognizing the, the difference between what is an easy task or a complex task for your portfolio. But do you have a standard way to represent what is a hard task for planning? No, because it, there is no hard, hard task. No, no, I think we, in fact, we decided we made that. And definition because there is no definition. In fact, there is not. A, you cannot think in in in, a, in in easy and hard problems, but you need to think in easy and hard problems for a given planner, because what is easy for one planner can be very hard for another, and that's why planning portfolios works uh, pretty well. Because planning portfolios, you have a, a, a diversity of planners. Uh, uh, you, maybe you include in the portfolio, when, when you receive a, a, dom a new problem in a new domain, maybe one pr a planner is very bad for solving that problem, but then you have another one which will behave very well. So that's why diversity in planning portfolios is very good. Because problems which are hard for one planner could be easy for another planner. So there is no, uh, well, you can even you can you can always think in in a general hard problem for for most of planner maybe depending on the type of planners if they are based on graph plan or whatever, but uh, but um, you don't know it depends on the planner. I'm wondering about uh, like a subset of features that are always uh, an important fact for for any problem like, like if you represent uh, if you get this information mm. from any domain. No. It will be hard to solve this problem. Yeah, but it's what I told. Uh, if you see the, the problem is that I don't have the slide, but it is in the paper. If you see, uh, because the results that I have show, uh, shown here are, are completely aggregated. So you can see in the paper the result for each domain. So you can see that, that features that are uh, very relevant in one domain are completely useless in, a, in another domain. So, so there's no correlation. There is no correlation. Yeah. So what we show here is kind of. Uh, I, oh, sorry, it was, need, it was not this slide. Here is it's an aggregation, so it gives you an idea of. So in general, those features are used are are are, more, are useful, more useful than others. But you cannot say that for every domain it will be useful. So uh, um, you found that uh, the talking about uh, clustering domains. Um, have you ever looked at this data? So would your prediction be able to group all our logistics domains in a single group? I mean, would it see that? that like well, and it could be that maybe some problems in logistics are clustered with uh, problems of another domain. Yeah, I mean, yeah, no, I'm not talking about logistics like with the name, but I mean, we have lots of transportation problems, right? Uh -huh. and they are all very similar. 
Yeah. And I, I just wonder if, if your prediction sees that. I mean, if like yeah. what, whatever you need to transport, if it's like passengers with elevators, yeah, yeah. packages with trucks, and whatever, planes, we have all these variations, would, would they be clustered in the, in the same group? Yeah, yeah so maybe. We didn't try, okay? Mm -hmm. But it's, it's, it's one of the opportunities that having a good uh, set of features characterizing the, the problems uh, could, could, could provide us. So I think th those are very interesting research lines. Yeah. Uh, well, this is uh, just uh, for your information. Um, so you, in this slide that you evaluated the uh, other easy problem and the hard problem, and uh, that was measured by the runtime. Uh, but the, the elder Cohen sitting over there has a very good theory on the estimating the easy, hard, easy pattern on search problem, so I recommend something like that. Uh -huh. Also, it would be nice to see the work too. Just, just uh, for your information. Uh -huh. Thank you. <coughs> I have one question since you know there are some works where you can see significant difference of planning performance just by shuffling predicates and operators in PDDL models. So clearly here the model is the same, but I mean you know the problem files, you know, you might have somehow different ordering of initial row predicates. So did you observe something like this or so this is the kind of things that we didn't try. We know that there are many people doing these kind of things. So in fact, in the in the in the group, we 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 have a, a few people doing these kind of experiments. So that's why we were worried about these shallow features uh, that, that we said before. So these things that does not seem to be correlated, but uh, that, though that that appears to be correlated, but that in fact there is no a, a, a real causality. So so well, it's it's, it's something that that could be a Evaluate it. Okay. Yeah. So I think we have still time for one more question. So, so all the questions were answered. <laughs> so Thank you very much. Let's thank the speaker again.